OK, welcome to the introductory lecture on RNA-seq. This is going to give us some background that we need uh, in order to understand the kinds of data. Um, so what's what goes into a gene expression study? Um, and so what you'll need to do is download the RNA-seq intro PowerPoint from Canvas. And then I have it broken down into the intro video, which is what I'm going to cover in this. Sorry, the intro PowerPoint, which is what I'm going to cover in this video. And then a second uh, video and PowerPoint will go with the tutorial uh, that we'll do in Galaxy. OK. Let me share my screen. That will make more sense. All right, so this. <clears throat> RNA-seq intro, which you should be able to find in the RNA-seq module on Canvas. Okay. So I call this transcriptomics because really that's what an RNA-seq uh, experiment is usually doing. Uh, you're trying to estimate all of the genes that are being expressed by sequencing all of the transcripts that are currently in whatever tissues or cells that you're sampling. So we're going to kind of walk through the basic RNA-C workflow. I'll talk a little bit about library prep, and then we'll talk about, um, so basically, how are you getting the, the data? Then uh, spend a little bit of time on the analysis pipeline and how that depends on whether you have a reference genome or not. Um, and then a little bit at the end about <clears throat> how you look at it and what does it mean. So there are lots of benefits to an RNA-seq uh, experiment. Uh, RNA-seq has sort of revolutionized and democratized uh, the ability to get um, genomic data, although it's not really genomic data, right? It's uh, only accessing the things that are described in the genome, right? We're just pulling out all the RNA and then sequencing that. Um, but that is a lot of information, and in many cases, that's a lot of the functional information. Uh, the thing you're missing in a transcriptome study is that you're not getting the non-coding DNA, so you're not getting some of the, the regulatory information that you would get if you have a whole genome project, for example. OK. RNA-seq studies have, you know, I just have a list here of a few of the, the reasons that, that they're beneficial beyond just measuring genes uh, uh, and transcript levels, uh, uh, which is their main purpose. But you can also improve reference genome assemblies, uh, right? Because uh, when you reference a transcript, at least in eukaryotes, and you've got um, genes that are broken up by introns, what you ultimately get is a sequence that might span a much larger piece of the genome because you have, say, a sequence from exon 1, 2, 3, and there are big introns in the genome between those exons. So now when you get your transcriptome, you know that those things must be linked in physical space. On, in the genome. And so sometimes that can help you assemble contigs or scaffolds that weren't already stuck together in the genome assembly. Um, obviously, you can, same thing goes, you can uh, improve the reference genome annotation because now you're going to be able to see exactly where those intron exon boundaries are, which are very difficult to predict sometimes computationally. You can measure differential exon use, right? You get one transcript that has one, two, and three, and a different transcript that has only one and three. Um, so that's alternative splicing. You can detect single nucleotide variants, just like the section, the variant calling section that we uh, talked about in the last module. You can measure allele-specific expression, potentially. Right. So you, the benefit is you're not just getting um, transcript abundance, you're 
getting the actual sequence. So you you can detect the SNVs. That allows you to say, you know, assuming you have a heterozygous individual, how much of one allele is being expressed relative to the other allele. <clears throat> and then um, this was a real eye opener when RNA seq started to be um, sort of hit the mainstream. Is just how much antisense transcription goes on. There is a ton of stuff being transcribed that is not um, protein coding, right? So not just so I, I listen uh, long non coding RNAs. That's what LNC RNA stands for. Um, and presumably they have regulatory function, although knocking. At least in mouse and ye I think maybe yeast, um, there's lots of evidence that you can knock a lot of these things out and not generate a phenotype. So um, a lot of research and, and really interesting stuff going on and what why all this, what seems like it ought to be expensive transcription going on that doesn't code for protein. Open question. So. How does an RNA seq experiment proceed? We I talked a little bit um, at the beginning of the GVA section about how you generate libraries for next gen sequencing. Um, that is RNA seq especially is still almost exclusively done on the Illumina platform because in this case, you know, I talked about in the GBA analysis how things are moving to some of these long read technologies like PacBio and Oxford Nanopore or or using Illumina in the high C where you have contact information so you can get really long range information for genome assembly um, or for for mapping purposes, helping you map and repeat heavy regions in RNA seq you're not as concerned, especially if this is going to be reference mapping, so you have a reference genome. You're not so concerned about that long distance information. So still very common to use paired ends to get the unique mapping information. Um, but there hasn't been as big a move to use like PacBio or Oxford Nanopore. And this goes back to how cheap Per base pair it is to sequence with Illumina. Okay. Just some of the steps here. I'll, I'll talk about some of these in more detail. Right, we're going to talk about RNA extraction, the importance of having good quality RNA, uh, and then some of the library steps that you have to do that depend on what kind of RNA you're going after. Uh, I'm going to bypass some of the details for normalization, dealing with uh, small RNA and what I mean, library prep uh, normalization. And then uh, how you might deal with rare or small RNAs, because there are different library preps that you um, want to use if, if you're interested in specific size classes of RNA. So, um, right, micro RNAs uh, of all flavors. Are not going to be captured a lot of times due to the size selection, right? If we're doing 150 base pair paired end sequencing, you're not going to capture RNAs that are 20 base pairs long. Um, and so you have to do special library preps for that. Not going to cover that because it, it's kind of a niche. Um, the analysis and things, a lot of uh, things are still relevant. It's just how you build the libraries that uh, has some differences. The this has become becoming maybe it uh, whoops um, less of an issue because most people have moved to just doing stranded because we now know that antisense transcription uh, is such a big deal. Um, so I I won't talk about that as much either. So first up, um, looking at your RNA quality. This is typically, at least in eukaryotes and really in vertebrates, measured as the ratio of 18 and 28S peaks. Uh, this is These are bioanalyzer uh, runs. So this is what beautiful RNA looks like 
as it gets broken down, and I guess what I, we should be, <laughs> what I should point out, what is this graph looking at, right? So this is the size along the x-axis, like the length of the base pairs, and then the peak is how much of that molecule is in there. So we get a big peak right here, uh, and I don't remember how many base pairs that is off the top of my head, but you can see that most of the RNA in this sample falls into these two peaks, right? And these are the ribosomal RNAs, which are the most abundant molecule in any sort of RNA extraction you do, it, you do at, at least in eukaryotes. But I need, I should, I'm gonna have to stop saying that Almost everything I talk about is going to be predicated on talking about eukaryotes. You can still do these in bacteria, obviously, but um, the, the metrics for for RNA quality are going to be a little different. Um, and you know, when we when I talk about poly A selection, not, obviously not not relevant. But I'll, I'll have to stop saying in eukaryotes. Just that's the default for me. Um, here, when you start to see the things like this, this is partially degraded. So what does that mean? It means that lots of our ribosomal RNA has sort of been fragmented into smaller pieces. And so it's an indicator for the quality of the rest of the RNA in the sample, right? There's so much of the ribosomal RNA that it's kind of dwarfing the signal of everything else. But you know when that ribosomal RNA starts to degrade, that's probably happening to everything else in the sample as well. Here, when it really starts to get bad, you can't even distinguish those peaks. And then here, this is completely degraded, right? Everything is just small pieces of RNA. You don't have intact uh, ribosomal RNAs. Uh, this is just real data from my lab. Um, and, and I put it in here uh, partly because you know, some of us, some of you work on vertebrates and some of you work on insects or other non-model systems. Those traditional metrics don't always work super well. Um, so, for example, in insects, the ribosomal RNA doesn't, um, the 28, 28S region has a breakpoint in it so that it actually migrates. These are clean RNAs, it, but they only give one peak. Okay, that was sort of a hard lesson as we, <laughs> when, when we were first getting into the RNA-seq world, you know, a while ago, um, everyone thought we should be looking for peaks that look like this, and that's based on vertebrates. Uh, turns out insects don't do that. And it had been known earlier, it just hadn't been translated. You know, people found out about this back in the 80s. Um, but then, so this is a mouse experiment from my lab where you see we have nice peaks, but then we also often had this weird third hump, and that is DNA contamination. So in the extraction protocol, our DNA was not working very well. Um, so we had all this DNA, and that's that's bad because when you go to make your library in the next step, you're now no longer only going to be sampling transcribed genes. You're going to have this mess of genomic stuff in there, and that will mess up your inference of gene expression, right? The main point of the experiment um, being to find out which genes are expressed and which aren't. If you're getting DNA contention in there, you might get reads from genes that aren't actually being transcribed because you had genomic DNA in your sample. So like I said, ribosomal RNA uh, takes up a huge component of your RNA extraction, but when you then want to go do the sequencing, you don't really care about sequencing the ribosomal RNA in most cases. So how do we get rid of that? Well, there are three ways <clears throat> most experiments go about enriching. So ribosomal RNA reduction uh, by a variety of methods. These all come in kits, but uh, you know, an enzyme or um, yeah, I don't even actually know all the methods for for straight ribosomal re RNA reduction that don't involve capturing the non-ribosomal RNA stuff. 
what I mean by that is uh, two and three, where you have cDNA capture. So you actually have probes. In that case, you would actually be um, putting in, you could think of them like primers or call them probes that are going to bind to specific genes. So there are exon capture kits in humans, for example, and you can specialize on them. Uh, you can get specialized kits that have probes that are, say, just for inflammatory pathway genes. What does that do? Well, it then goes in and grabs the genes that you're interested in, and then you can wash everything else away so that you're only spending your sequencing dollars on the genes that you're interested in. And then you can measure the differential expression of just those genes. Now, um, in my lab and most of the labs around UTA, we're, most, we're usually doing whole transcriptome RNA-seq. And in that case, we are um, doing poly-A selection. So basically getting all of the messenger RNAs, right? That's what poly-A selection is going to do. So you're, in this case, putting in a poly-T probe that is going to bind to the poly-A tail of all the messenger RNAs, pull those down, wash everything else away. And now you are only going to spend your sequencing dollars on the genes that were being transcribed at the time. Okay. So this cartoons are just kind of demonstrating those three, what and what they're good for. Um, so we've gotten to ribosomal RNA depletion. Um, the next step is, you, know, you may have barcoding. So especially, I talked about this in the GVA section about the, the massive throughput of some of the modern Illumina machines, um, oftentimes you may be barcoding samples so that you, be, well, it depends on how deep you want to sequence your RNA, but most of the time you're sequencing less DNA, right? If most genomes are, say, 2% at most protein coding stuff, you're actually having a small fraction. Now, you, you can't just say, I only need to do 2% of the sequencing, right? Because you're interested in sequencing each molecule or, or, or each transcript lots of times. So, or not explaining that very well. If you have one gene that's expressed at 10 times another gene, you need to do enough sequencing so that you can actually tell that difference. We're gonna get to that. that, that if that's not clear now, it will become more clear later in the, the lecture as we look at, at these things and analyze differential expression. But the, the key step that then comes in after barcoding and, and sort of that technical part of finishing the library. Now, the, the big question is, do you have a reference genome or are you going to have to assemble your transcriptome de novo? So we're going to talk about the extra assembly step uh, in a minute. If you have a reference genome, the reads can just be mapped to the reference genome in sort of the same way that we did for, for variant analysis, but I even discussed back in the GVA section, you have to have a, a intron aware or RNA aware aligners, right, because of the whole intron exon problem. Okay. If you have a reference genome, that is almost always going to be the way to go um, because it, it improves the ability to know that, well, to, to basically tell the difference between uh, isoforms and paralogs. So you don't know if you don't have a reference genome that these that there's actually a, a duplication of this gene you it's hard to tell the difference between a du duplication of the gene in the genome versus um slightly different transcription from the same gene 
right? Especially if you've got different uh, isoforms of that gene, right? If exon two is left out, you don't know if that's a paralog where the exon has been lost, or it's just in some version of the transcript that exon gets left out. So you can't tell the difference between the gene content in the genome and the transcript isoforms. That's the benefit really of having the reference genome. Uh, and then de, de novo transcriptomes, I'm going to talk more about that. The the nice thing, you know, one of the reasons RNA-seq revolutionized genomics is that you can now get functional information for all the genes, potentially, everything that's being expressed, even if you don't have a genome. So non-model species that have, have really big genomes and would be a nightmare to try to sequence to actually get a good genome and genome assembly, you can still get lots of functional information by just sequencing the RNA and looking at gene expression, okay? And then there are some, some downsides to, uh, to these as well. Assembling them can be hard. We're gonna talk about that. E even assembling the, the transcriptomes um, and then obviously you've got to, if you want to make statements about which genes are present and absent, that, that's very hard to do from a de novo transcriptome because you never, you can, what is the evidence for absence of a gene? In an RNA-seq experiment, if you don't get it in the transcriptome, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not in the genome. It just means it wasn't expressed in the time or the tissue that you were sampling it. So I don't need to cover this anymore. We, this is the same deal, right? Paired end re read mapping is not fundamentally different uh, for RNA seq than it was for genomic reads. Uh, it's just what went into the library prep and the fact that the, the aligner has to be aware that there could be an intron there. And so this space between the reads is not really relevant to the genome anymore, okay? So if you're doing reference mapping, you just have to allow for the fact that uh, those reads might might not match the way you expect, okay? And so there are lots of ways that that pops up, okay? Uh, not just could the, the, um, the space between the reads be different than you would expect based on the genome, but you get situations where the, the actual read, um, so here, these are split reads, and these are the best reads for defining intron exon boundaries, right? So for example, on, I don't know if you can see that, pull my laser pointer out. This read where you have the dotted lines, that's actually one read. So for example, that's 150 base pairs, that end to that end, but genome where you align it, that might be a thousand base pairs. So you've got like 50 base pairs. And then in the genome, there's a, another thousand base pairs and then another 75 base pairs over here. That defines the intron exon boundaries in that read because it goes, hits that end of that blue one and then the read skips over and picks up right there. Okay, and so that's also what I meant about getting this long range information from, from, for example, this orange one tells you that these, this segment of the genome must be connected physically. Okay, and in a, when you're doing a genome assembly, that might not have happened. And so hopefully you can write this cartoon makes sense. You've got lots of reads from exon one, two, three. That's that's the sort of normal map, the reads that are mapping normally. And you've got those split reads I was talking about. And then what I started talking about here, these are situations where obviously we've got several read pairs here that define an, a transcript that includes exon one and two. But then you've also got this read that says, hey, there's a transcript that to include exon two because we got a read that mapped to exon one and a read that mapped to exon three. That that can't happen if exon two is in there, right? Because this read 
would have landed in exon two because it's sequencing off the off this molecule. Well, uh, sorry, the molecule here, right? Think about what's the inference. The molecule that these reads came from has exon one stuck on to exon three. With no, nothing in the middle. Hopefully that makes sense, right? Th this orange thing, because these, yeah, this is the tough thing about not doing this live, is all of these reads are 150 base pair paired end standard, right, 200 base pairs in the middle. So this orange read that spans this huge distance in the genome, the read itself is just 150 base pairs with 200 base pairs in the middle. So that read says that the molecule that this read came from had exon one and exon three stuck right next to each other, right? They're only 200 base pairs apart on the molecule that that read came from. And then just showing you how you can potentially find allele specific expression. Um, you still have the same kind of variant calling things we were talking about before, right? If you get a rare one, like the one that I circled in red, that could be a sequencing error. So you still have to do the same kind of variant calling things that, that we did for GVA. But here, the black arrows show sites where the reference genome has a G, but there's a mix of A's and G's there. Over here, there's a mix of T's and G's. So that suggests that there's some heterozygosity and both alleles are being expressed. You can quantify the sort of ratio between um, which, you know, is there allele biased expression? Okay. And this is harder in RNA-seq to distinguish errors from uh, allele specific expression bias because, right, if this was genomic DNA, you would say, oh yeah, that's definitely an error because there are exactly two copies of both alleles in the genome that you sequence from in, in your sample. In an RNA-seq experiment, you don't know the true ratio of G's to C's at this position, right? It could be that this is highly allele by it, like allele-specific expression almost, because this allele only got expressed one time. And so on a site-by-site -site basis, you couldn't actually tell, but what you end up doing is looking for phasing. OK, so what is it connected to? Well, it looks like, you know, we have the A variant and the G variant to this thing. On this one with the same haplotype, it has a G. So, you know, the probability the software will take the, the linkage information into account, the linkage information within the reads to try to help determine is that allele bias expression or is it or just to give you an idea, um, this is one of the common pipelines, it's not exactly the one that we're going to use, but these are um, some of the top half was one of the early RNA-seq aligners. Um, and it, it was built on bowtie, but just transcript aware, so or intron aware. Um, so if you, you'll see in the literature, uh, this tuxedo protocol um, is pretty common. Uh, all those, we're going to use different packages, but the overall sort of outline of what you're doing is the same. It's just going to be different different software packages that are faster and, and built for the the volume of data that we can collect today. So that's all well and good, right? Tuxedo is is meant for um, reference alignments, right? Just like, right, it's built on bow tie, which is bow tie two is what we use for genome variant analysis. <clears throat> okay, so what about without a reference genome? And so um, 
for our final projects. So for the RNAC tutorial that we'll do, I'll do in the next video, we're going to do reference alignment to a Drosophila melanogaster genome. For the final project, we have de novo genomes. So I'm going to actually, not de novo genomes, de novo transcriptomes. So what I'm going to walk through now is the process of, OK, I don't have a reference genome. I just did my RNA-seq experiment, so I've got all these RNA-seq reads. How do I assemble the transcriptome so that I can go back and align the reads to tell me how to, to quantify the gene expression? Okay. So what do you do when you don't have a reference genome? So first of all, uh, for a long time, the question was whether it was good to build your de novo assemblies based on each sample independently. That's the answer has kind of the consensus is no. Much better transcriptomes if you pool all your samples to build the transcriptome first. And it may seem a little counterintuitive, but then you have the complete transcriptome and now you're going to go back and take each sample individually and then map each sample to that overall transcriptome and that's going to tell you which ones are expressed right so even though you used all the samples to to build the transcriptome if a gene was not expressed in a sample when you go back to map it you won't see that that gene was expressed in that sample okay um the most common protocol or and software pro it's both a protocol and a software package it's called trinity uh, and it's really a pipeline that does uh, three steps in inchworm chrysalis butterfly. We're going to just kind of walk through this. This is uh, since this is a bioinformatics class, going to just give you some of the details that are going on under the hood, although. Trinity is pretty easy to uh, deploy uh, in a local environment. Now, if you've got a big data set, we're going to talk about the computational challenges, so you could run it on your laptop, but on sort of real data, real experiments, uh, you, know, mil, you know, 50, 100 million reads, uh, that's not something you're going to want to do on your laptop. So we're, we'll walk through each of these. Um, this is kind of an overview slide, but you'll see what each of these does as we go through. So inchworm is the step that actually starts to build the, re the contigs for the reads. So by default, it's going to take all of the reads and break them up into Camers that are 25 base per pairs long. Now, my cartoons are not going to be to scale necessarily. Um, <clears throat> it then sort of quantifies the frequency of each of those 25 MERS, and it starts with the most frequent Kmer. So, for example, here I've got the, the most frequent 9 MER hypothetically, and then it says, OK, if I add an A, C, G, or T, what's the frequency in my overall set of kmers? Like, how many reads have this kmer and then add an A, C, G, or T? So what you can see is there are actually four reads that have an A and four reads that have a T after that nine-mer. So, in this case, we actually have to keep the A and the T. Now, how many reads have, you know, A, C, G, or T? Well, now we're up to three reads that have A and then C. And here we've got four, five, six reads that go T and then G. So we're going to only keep this one because now we have a maximum, not a tie. Do that again. Then you do it on the other end. All right. And so what this doing is now pulling out reads from our huge pool that connect in this way. Right. 
So we re report that resulting contig, that is the, the, the longest uh, connection. We re remove all of the k-mers that helped build that, and then we start over, go back to now the, what's the next most common k-mer, and start doing that all over again. What that does is build a whole bunch of contigs. And it's really it, it's good and it's really fast at doing that, but you run into a problem because it doesn't it can't account for differential exon use. So here I've given an example where a gene has two isoforms. Um, one has three exons and one only has two. So in the genome, you might sort of give this graphical representation of what's going on, where sometimes you get exon one and two connected to each other, and sometimes you include exon, uh, sorry, one and three connected, and sometimes you include exon two. Well, the output from inchworm is going to build a contig that has one and three connected, and then another contig that is, um, represented by this. And the, this ratio is often going to be skewed because right, all of the reads that mapped to the end, this stuff right out here also mapped on this one. Okay, So we really only have a small subset where the orange and yellow and green and yellow were sort of unique, right? And that's, that, that's why this thing got built. But Inchworm doesn't know that this orange and that orange are the same. So it gets reported as two separate contigs. So that's where chrysalis starts to come in. And what it's gonna do is try to look at the overlaps between the ends of each contig and all the rest of the contigs. So try to find, you know, explicitly looking for this kind of situation where actually this could be a subset of some other um, cluster of contigs. So how does it do that? Uh, this sort of complicated figure, right? I, I like I, this one makes more sense to me, but you can see kind of how this is creating a bubble where you might not know you've got something that maps here and then it doesn't really map uniquely in this chunk but then it joins up again over here on this end, okay? So there's a there's a bubble that happens over the yellow part that connects this green through this contig and back into that that part of the the first contig. And that's kind of what this is representing. The way it does this is by pulling one base pair off the end every time and then looking how does that affect this map. And it's doing that against all of the other clusters. So this is a, a really big computational problem, right? If you have to ask, <laughs> how does how do the ends, the, the, the K minus one mer, match to all the other clusters? That's a big computation because you might have thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of clusters, depending on how, uh, how many different isoforms are in your, your sample. Uh, and the speed is going to be relative to how much RAM do you have? So how how many clusters can you hold in memory? Because that's the fastest um, fastest way to to compare is to hold them hold them all in memory. Butterfly then. So Chrysalis is making this graph, and Butterfly then collapses the graphs. So you take these maps, they're called De Bruyne maps, and, and th this is similar to, the, it's the same underlying principles as genome assembly. Uh, it, it's just a little bit bigger or a different problem for RNA-seq. Um, you take this graph and say, okay, how can you collapse that graph into the the shortest path that's the like what is the shortest path through this diagram well if you collapse a bunch of these 
what you end up seeing is that, okay, there are actually only a few sites where there's an alternative way to get the transcript, right? So one way is I have an A right there, okay? So then I grab that whole chunk, then I had need a C and I grab that whole chunk. It determines what is the best path here based on how many reads support that. So if we go all the way back here, right, do you sort of stitch this thing together into this, right? Because really remind yourself what we're looking for. It's that my, uh, oh, there we go. My pointer died. Should this look like this is the question. And so it goes and looks for how, how many reads do I have that really support connecting this green piece to this larger green piece? How many reads do I have that support connecting this orange piece to this larger orange piece? I'm not, so that's the, the probability. So what are the most probable paths? And ultimately, you end up with these clusters of, se of sequencing that essentially now we've reconstructed, at least ideally, the full length transcripts recognizing differential exon use. So we would call these things the same gene, but different isoforms of that gene. Always a question about whether are those actually different isoforms? Or are they different genes? Which I, I sort of mentioned earlier, the isoform paralog problem. Here's this is just a, a extended example where we've got transcript one here. There are lots of reads that connect the blue bit to the green bit, and there are not so many that connect the the red bit. So because green and blue are really highly connected, you know that there's a sort of a full length here, whereas the original contig coming out of inchworm would have just been a little fragment here that had right, the red and then a few reads, like five reads and two reads that were left over to connect it to, to blue. This is a real example where this kind of thing might happen. But these sequences are from this example where there's actually a very rare, uh, rarely included exon. But RNA-seq, like there's no way to find this from genome sequencing. The only way you find these things, and one of the big benefits of, of in terms of genome annotation, is that you do pick this stuff up in RNA-seq experiments. Here's another way more complicated example. Um, you know, this is an example of an isoform, okay? This is an example where it looks way more complicated. So you might say, oh, there's a whole bunch of differential exon use, and I can't believe how blurry that is. Um, that picture did not copy well. Um, so what ends up happening with this is that you have a, a transcript one represented by the green there mapping to the reference and then this other transcript that is also mapping almost the same way but it, those and actually end up being uh not different transcripts but different parallel even though and and, and right it's basically impossible to tell in some cases is it a transcript or is it uh, not is it a transcript? Is it an isoform or is it a paralog? Just to give you some kind of idea for um, the these different steps require different computational resources. And so, Although I said they're easy to deploy, they're not so easy to optimize. Um, for example, 
the inchworm and chrysalis stages, well, inchworm for sure, where you're just doing the initial assembly stage, the more of those millions and millions of reads you can hold in memory, the faster it will go. And you can't really parallelize that because you can't have one CPU or one node working on a one part, one subset of the reads and a different node or a different CPU working on a different subset of the reads because you need to compare all of those reads together in order to get the full assembly. So that's a, a, a situation that is not, you can't parallelize that very much. But it, you, the more memory you have, the better. So this is where you want just like one node, but with a massive amount of memory. So bridges two, you might have noticed we have um, allocations on the regular memory nodes, which is everything we've used so far. And then we have extreme memory nodes. And I think those are four terabytes of RAM memory, which is insane. Um, right, that's a thousand fold more than some of the laptops have. Uh, so that's the kind of node though that you would want to do the de novo assembly part of the pipeline, inchworm, for example. Now, chrysalis, I talked about, this is also a case where you wanna have all the clusters as many clusters as possible in memory, but you can subdivide them to some extent because you know, you know, I could go back, think about, go back here, for example, you could have all of the things that have reads that are potentially associated with this working on one node and another set working on another node. Um, I think I, you know, when I was going through, I said you'd want to hold them all in memory. That That's not exactly the case for Chrysalis, right? So there are lots and lots of clusters, but you could be working on those clusters at the same time on different nodes. So this is something that you can parallelize. Now, lots of caveats there about how many isoforms there are going to determine the size and number of the clusters. So having lots of RAM will still speed things up, but it can be parallelized, unlike inchworm that really can't. And then finally, butterfly, when you're collapsing all those clusters, because now all the clusters are built. You, you know all of the things that are going to, you need to try to find the, the optimal path through to really build the, the transcripts um, in the right way with the different isoforms. Now you, you can, like, if you've got a thousand clusters, now you can put each of those clusters on a different node and work on them all simultaneously, right? Uh, this is a rule of thumb right out of the Trinity guide that basically you want a gigabyte of RAM per million reads um, on the workflow and then as parallelized as you can get uh, on the workflow, on inchworm especially. Okay, and then as parallel as you can get um, for chrysalis and butterfly. That's the, the time that you can expect. Obviously, this is a, a moving target as processors get faster and algorithms get better. Um, actually, it's mostly about processors getting faster. The, the Trinity algorithm has been pretty static for a while, and it's good. Everybody uses it. So not, not just processors, right? Ability to parallelize. So on a machine where you can get 10 nodes or um, if you can move this onto a graphical processor unit, okay, thinking back to our Exceed hardware infrastructure, this is one of those times where you'd be you would benefit in terms of time if you have say 50,000 clusters that you need to analyze. You could take one GPU and run them all in parallel. And even though the GPU processors are slower than a regular computer processor, the fact that you can put all 50,000 of them on at one time and, and run them at the same time means it's still going to be way faster.
what's the output? So you finish Trinity uh, and. Oh, I guess I should also back up and say one of the the tricky parts about running this on something like bridges um, is that. They most of the nodes, I think it's still true for the regular mem and extreme mem nodes on. Bridges have a 48 hour limit, so you might not finish. Right, if you've got. You know, a typical experiment might have. Multiple samples that have 40 million reads. Right, you don't have 80 or 120 hours that you can take up resource on this. So Trinity has built in checkpoints where it will run inchworm and then stop and write the output or it will less stop and write the output. So you don't have to do that in one job or if the job dies, you haven't lost all that time. Right? The worst would be you ran your 48 hours uh, of allocation and it died and you have to start all over. That Trinity has good built in checks for that. OK, so assuming it finished now, oh, what does it look like? This this is what a transcriptome looks like. You Trinity gives it a name, right? This is cluster zero, sequence one, and sometimes they're even more complicated. We'll look at the ones uh, for our, our class project data because this is. Your. Reference transcriptome for the for the class projects. Um, that this is what they'll they're going to look like. It's a giant FASTA file with assembled transcripts um, already done for you because there's, we just wouldn't have the 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 time or really the what I mean is time on bridges. Uh, we don't our allocation would not accommodate doing Trinity on uh, five new transcriptomes for for every for all the people in class to be able to experience that. So that part is going to be done. Um, and so you're going to do the sort of next steps of quantification. So that's the transcriptome. Trinity gave it a name. And. Generated a fast date file that has the sequences. So next in the workflow, we've got our. You might call them gene models. These are our transcripts. Um, now we're going to go through and map our reads to try to quantify. Not as straightforward as you might think. So th this, this is where the interesting parts of RNA-seq gene quantification come in or, or expression quantification. If all genes were essentially the same size, quantification would be easy, right? So here I've got a blue gene and a pink gene. I have way more reads that are mapping to the pink gene. This is the a graph of the read counts, right? So way more pink reads that translates to expression value. OK. Baseline, this is the whole idea of how do you quantify gene expression? If all genes were the same size, done, easy, right? Read count exactly correlated with expression value. We got more reads from gene two. That means it was a more highly expressed gene than gene one. The problem is all genes are not the same size, right? So here I've got gene three, which is a short transcript, right? Just two smallish exons and gene four, which is a really long transcript. And so now if we think about how do I compare gene three and gene four? Well, gene four actually in absolute terms has more reads that map to it. But that's because it was a much longer molecule. So we sequenced it more times or we didn't sequence the molecule more times. We just got more reads from that molecule because it was so much bigger, right? The target was bigger. So we need to have some way to normalize based on the length of the transcript, right? So what is the probability that if everything was expressed at the same level, I would get a read from a particular transcript that is associated with how long was that transcript, right? What's the target size?
And so, you know, I'm going to show you a couple of the ways we do that, but as long as I'm here, it really is as simple as accounting for how long is the gene or how long is the total transcript. One of the other issues that comes up that makes this a little bit problematic is that when you have reads that map to multiple transcripts, it confounds the estimation of abundance. So <clears throat> over here on the left, these are two isoforms of the same gene. You've got right the, the blue sections are shared and then the colored sections are not shared between the, the isoforms. What ends up happening is right, all of these blue reads mapped to both isoform A and isoform B. So estimating what's the expression level, because we're going to get an expression level for this gene is complicated because here we we sort of have proportionally the same number of reds as blues down here we have way less yellows than blues if this is you know think about what's going on in the biology this doesn't really make sense because you you should expect a picture like this if these reads were mapping uniquely there's no reason why you ought to be sequencing the two ends of the molecule more than the middle. And so EM stands for expectation maximization. So essentially you normalize across the reads to try to account for that fact. So how many of these things that map in both places? Well, you look at places in that transcript that map uniquely and sort of use that as a weighting mechanism to say, OK, how many then, what proportion of the multiply mapped reads belong to each of the transcripts? That gives me a, a better idea for what's the relative level of expression between those two things. That's the main, this expectation maximization, that's the method used by these software packages, which are really common. There are others. Um, in some cases, just a strategy is to just look at the uniquely mapped stuff, okay, or randomly assign it to one or the other. Okay, these are all the most recent ones. Most people have moved to this sort of expectation maximization approach. Uh, and, th and then going back to the issue of how long it is. So this issue, right, normalization. Um, you'll see reads per kilobase million and fragments per kilobase million. Um, there is a lot of text on this slide. I already said the, the bottom line is you're trying to correct for how long is the transcript. So it's normalizing, right, the number of reads. How does that correlate with the expression level? no matter how long the gene is. Well, essentially you're just gonna divide by how long is the gene. And the RPKM and then TPM is the one that you see most often now. Um, and it allows you to compare one, uh, one gene to the next. Too many details to really make it worth walking through step by step for that. And I guess I colored this blue because TPM is what you see most common now. It, it, the pub papers that are coming out right, you know, in the last year, two years. Um, it, it's really about the order of operations. They're all trying to do the same thing. Um, Some of the challenges that we're left with, so that that's that kind of gets to the end, right? This is what you're going to do now. Talking about how do you determine whether a gene is statistically differently differentially expressed? 
lots of factors go into study design, uh, like how many samples can you get? And one of those challenges is how deep do you sequence? OK, so one of the challenges is normalization. OK, not so much a challenge, just an extra step. But then how deep do you have to sequence is a real question. And mostly this ends up coming down to budget. How many samples do you want to collect? Um, and then there's always going to be a trade off between getting more samples and sequencing deeper. The more reads you get, which is what I mean by sequencing deeper, the more low expressed genes you're going to get. So you can think of getting more reads as more times you're going to reach into the bag and pull out a, an RNA molecule, right? So how many times are you going to sample your RNA pool? That is, how deep are you going to sequence? Obviously, the more times you sample, more reads you get, the higher the chance that you're going to grab something or sample something that is very low expression level. If you only sample a few times, like your read depth is low, you're only going to detect the things that are really abundant, usually. Right. And so then the question is, what, what should your detection threshold be? So if you got one read from a particular gene, does that mean it was expressed? Does it mean you had DNA contamination? Does it mean it was sort of leftover RNA from a cell or a different time point? Um, this minimum thresholding of detection, and it's especially important, right, because you never get exactly the same number of reads. Now, you can resample your data, right? I got 47 million reads from sample one and only 40 million reads from sample two. I don't have exactly the same depth. So should I subsample and throw away 7 million reads from one data set, or should I just raise my minimum detection threshold so that right, I'm throwing away some of the low express stuff that I got in the 47 million reads? Okay. Questions that you, you, you see different answers in different papers. You just have to be transparent about it uh, when you're doing those kinds of experiments. And it's one of the things, right, Galaxy, uh, will help with being transparent because um, the, the whole history would be there. And then the sequencing detects st affects statistical power to get at differential expression. So that's best illustrated with this um, example. So gene A, I have one read in sample A and two reads in sample B. There is a twofold change, right? The sample B um, has gene A expressed at twice the level. Is that biologically significant? Well, probably not, because this, like, this thing is being expressed at such a low level. You you have a twofold change, but it's only one read different. And compare that to gene B, that is a highly expressed gene where I got 100 reads in sample A and 200 reads in sample B, that's the same fold change, probably also going to be significant, biologically significant. And then the statistical significance here, this will not be detected, right? This, that is a one read change versus a 100 read change, OK? Now, if I sequenced, my sequencing was 10 or 100 times deeper, right? I just multiply these these numbers by however much more sequencing I generated. Now I have 10 versus 20 or 100 versus 200. Now this thing becomes significant and then obviously this thing still significant. So that deeper sequencing allows you to distinguish gene expression uh, between samples more readily. Uh, just a another maybe um, showing you how the p-values scale basically if you're doing Fisher's exact test to try to 
determine if there's a difference between samples in the in the gene expression. OK, so in every case, there's a twofold change, but that does not you won't get statistical significance. Um, for things that don't have very many reads, right? Your sampling is low. You and, and that's how you would want it to be, right? You'd want to be more. You're, you are more confident that this is a difference than you are that that's a difference. You can. That's what the p-value is telling you. You could get this by random chance. You are very unlikely to get this by random chance. Lots of tools for differential uh, sequence analysis. We're going to use DESeq2 in ours. Um, and I don't talk. I haven't talked about it here, but part of the reason, you know, one of the things that um, is important in these statistics, you know, why aren't we just using straight ANOVA or something like that? Well, gene expression is almost always uh, binomial distribution where you have lots of genes with low expression and then this really long tail where you have a, a few genes that are very highly expressed. So it, you, it looks like this L-shaped distribution oftentimes. Um, and so you you need uh, statistical software that take in all of that stuff that we talked about in terms of normalization, um, and then uh, account for the fact that you're comparing two binomial distributions. So what does it mean to be differentially have to come from a different dis distribution if both of them are binomial? So calculating probabilities on a binomial distribution is. is kind of what all these things are specialized to do. And then just a couple uh, examples of how you often see the results visualized. Volcano plots are trying to show you fold change on the, well, the relationship between fold change and statistical significance. All the stuff we just talked about, that relationship depends on sequencing depth to some extent. And so like where is the cutoff on the y axis, which is the p value axis, right? If you have really, really deep sequencing, the fold change, right? If you if you have really deep sequencing, you might detect a significant difference even at very low fold change. So that doesn't make sense. If we go back here, you know, if these are a thousand reads and, you know, let's say 1500 reads, you still have a 500 read difference. That's still pretty unlikely to be the, the same expression level, but it's only a point, you know, what is that? It's, this one is being expressed only at 0.5 fold increase okay if this is you know a thousand and fifty and one thousand five hundred um and so you're detecting a significant difference at lower than twofold change and so that's what this kind of graph is is trying to convey that in this case it looks like right we're not getting significant this until this is log two fold change so the like a log two of one this is a two-fold change right here So these, and then, but at the same time, right, our, um, this is the negative log of the, so this is basically how many zeros are there. So 0 0.001 significance is drawn across there. Okay. And essentially you, you're getting the group of things that are highly expressed and the, or upregulated and the things that are downregulated between whatever your samples are. The heat map, uh, each row in the heat map, and this is pretty standard, is a gene, and then each column is a sample. And so you can kind of see, oh, there's a huge group of genes that are downregulated, and then 
another group of genes that are upregulated. And the heat map is kind of a way to sort of visually cluster similarity among samples or among genes. Okay. So it would be an interesting question like, okay, what is this group of genes that seem to be downregulated in these samples versus upregulated in those? Uh, and then flipped over here. So, you know, then you go ask, okay, what's the function of this group of genes? And then last slide, you know, the elephant in the room for RNA-seq expression is that measuring transcript levels and they're not always very well correlated with protein levels. We, we know this best from bacteria, but um, measuring protein levels is a lot harder. And there's a fair amount of debate about whether the data that says there's not a good correlation between transcript level and protein level is just because we can't measure protein level as well as we can measure RNA seq level, uh, RNA level. So I would say that's an uh, something that you always have to be aware of. And when you're thinking about interpreting your data, that that caveat is always there, even if it's often implicit, not and, and not spelled out. That you know we're kind of assuming that. If we find all these downregulated genes are associated with this function, we're also saying that there's less of that protein there because protein is usually uh, the function, right? That's that's the functional endpoint. Okay, and so that's when you get to those sort of wet lab experiments. Okay, what happens if I knock that gene down so that you know use some kind of RNAi or CRISPR or something to get rid of the transcription um so lots of downstream validation might be necessary but that that elephant is is always there in the background of rna seq experiments all right so that's background uh for what rna seq experiments are all about uh, the the next video will be using Galaxy to actually do some RNA-seq analysis.